Counterman's Behind the Counter podcast goes behind the scenes of America's parts stores, warehouse distributors, and parts manufacturers with in-depth conversations with the men and women of the automotive aftermarket. Counterman editor Josh Cable takes you beyond the headlines so you can get to know the sales pros who are doing their part to make the aftermarket a great place to do business. In the late 1800s, Harris and Hannah Steinberg immigrated from Poland for a better life here in the United States, and they settled in Philadelphia. They owned and operated a wholesale and retail tobacco shop called H. Steinberg. Years later, their firstborn son Morris acquired the adjacent properties, and in 1922 he opened Morris Auto Parts. When Morris passed away, his brother Gene acquired the business. Today, Gene's son, Harris Steinberg, is the third generation of the family to be at the helm. Continuing a legacy of excellence and service as Morris Auto Parts celebrates its 100th year in business. We're very excited to have Harris Steinberg as our guest on the inaugural edition of Counterman's Behind the Counter podcast. Harris, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Josh. It's uh, an honor to be your guest. Uh, I'm really humbled by the interest in my family business. Uh, I have made some notes, so I will be reading at times uh, to answer your questions thoroughly. Um, but listen, we're, we're not a chain of a thousand stores. We're not even a small chain for that matter. It's just the one store in the original building with much of the original dust. And, and if you use promo code MO1922, we'll ship you some of that dust with your very first order. So. <laughs> a little plug there. That's, that's great. <laughs> all kidding and aside, the, the team at Mars, my family, our customers, they're all beaming with pride and grateful we're still serving the community's automotive needs. And I'm going to throw out a lot of names today because this has been an effort that so many deserve recognition for. I won't mention any employees because I don't want them pilfered, but I'm going to be direct. No sugar coating. We'll probably get emotional at some point mm -hmm. because this is very personal for me. As one of my favorite manufacturer reps, Bill Lorenzo, said to me recently when congratulating me, he said, making it through these last 30 years is no small feat. And everywhere we go, we meet people who used to live in the neighborhood and we're customers of Mars. 80-ish year olds often tell me stories of how their father used to take them to the store when they were little kids. One of my three sisters, Becky, lives two hours away, went camping the last weekend, met a retired couple who used to work in Philly, and on the nights and weekends had a shop as a side hustle and always bought parts at Mars Auto Parts. And we finally recalled my Uncle Ben Tipton, who was well-loved fixture at the store at the time, along with his brother, Jay. And I'm, I'm really excited to share my family story with you all. That's so cool. And we, yeah, we sure do appreciate it. And... Uh... As I have in my notes here, you know, I think it's it's really appropriate that you're the first, the very first guest on this podcast. Um, Morris, Morris Auto Parts is an independent parts store founded by immigrants in the heart of Philadelphia. And we know that's the city where the U.S. Constitution was written and signed in 1787. Uh, this is a third generation family owned business, and it's still going strong after 100 years. So this is really a classic story of the American dream. The other thing I should mention is that Harris may look familiar to some of our uh, folks in the audience. He was our 2006 Counter Professional of the Year, which is Counterman's flagship program for recognizing the most outstanding counter pros across the country. So let's get started. Like many store owners who are carrying on the family tradition, I know you grew up in the store. Uh, what are your earliest memories of being involved in the family business? Well. That's a good question. Having seven kids in the house, because I have six siblings, Mary, Morris, Hannah, Becky, Harris, Jean, Sam, as it went, uh, dad would always take a couple of them with him to the store to give my mom a break. We always, we all have similar memories of running through the aisles, catching air over the steps, climbing up the shelving, and exploring old nooks. No matter what we did or mess we made, dad never got mad, whether it was my brother and sister, Mary, at four and five years old, cutting the window security tape, or me running into an angle iron or a piece of shelving and needing stitches. <laughs> and uh, dad, was dad was always happy to have us there. And the employees might have felt differently, though. I think they <laughs> were a little annoyed. But, uh, <laughs> there was a lot to explore because it was not only a parts store and a machine shop, and then later on a repair shop, but there was also the family house that my grandparents raised my father and his four older siblings while running a tobacco business out of it. There was a lot, of, lot to snoop around and explore. I would open boxes to see what the parts looked like inside and try to figure out what they did. And dad always knew how to make it fun. We would often stop for a Slurpee on the way home or stop at a playground. And uh, it wasn't all just play though. Dad's dream was for his whole family to get into the business and he started training us early. Upstairs in the office from the ages of seven, 
or so. We remembered learning how to change the uh, using the bailing machine, endorsing checks with the stamp machine, and counting dirty money. Don't lick your fingers, Dad would say. And um, at home, my brother remembers my dad bringing catalogs and at the kitchen table, testing him on how to look up parts. And downstairs at the store, we learned how to mix paint. We had to stand on crates so that we could see the scale because we couldn't burn tall enough to see what was up on the table. And I would climb on the shelving behind the counter to answer phones. And my brother Morris learned how to cut cranks in the machine shop at a young age and had to stand on cases of press stone to operate the grinder and the welder. We worked through the teenage years as service advisors in the repair shop. And of course, once we had licenses, we could be sent out on deliveries all across the city. Dad was always encouraging us and had a lot of confidence in us that we could do it all. Best driver I ever had, he would tell my sister Mary after she went out and got back quickly. And he made an impression on all of us. He was proud. And we were proud of ourselves and gained confidence. Customers that initially were taken back or put off by young staff tending them, especially by girls in the 70s and 80s, came back asking for them to help them, whether it was mixing paint or looking up their parts or writing them up a repair estimate. My daughter, Jessica, who's uh, 21 now, has many of the same memories growing up. She remembers running down the aisles and climbing on the shelves like it was a jungle gym. Exploring the forgotten rooms with old parts or memorabilia or paperwork in them with a sense of awe and amazement that this place has been here for so long in our family. Mm. Of course, I followed my dad's training program, just remembers counting money, mixing paint, alphabetizing payables and matching up packing slips and invoices, checking an inventory by hand with a barcode scanner, putting away stock, taking inventories, cutting keys, just to name a few. But once acclimated, she really started liking the work and had enough confidence that she even trained new employees to do many of the same things. But she liked the entrepreneurial aspect of the business the best, like improving processes or spaces. She dressed up our display windows one summer with a unique, colorful, eye-catching displays that many reps remarked upon. And she wrote up many procedures and details so that others could follow easily and learn quicker. And she worked on our Google page and Yelp, along with printing helpful signs and charts. Of course, I tried to make it fun for her as well. And she finally remembers devouring fresh fruit, pasta leos, and water ice from vendors that would walk down the street and come in. So those are a lot of the earliest memories of mine and my daughters. I really appreciate you putting so much, uh, you know, so much thought and, and just the details. Um, it, it, I, I'm sure it feels like it was uh, yesterday, at, you know, when you when you think back to uh, to some of those times. Um, you know, we, we talk about family, family owned businesses and they're, they're pretty common in the automotive aftermarket, um, whether it's, you know, on the repair side or on the parts distribution side, it's, uh, we, we see so many of these, uh, businesses that are passed down from generation to generation. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, what did you learn from uh, working, you know, side by side with your dad? Um, with my dad, you know, keep in mind, he died when I was 21 as a junior and uh, from really on spring break from Albright College. So I got to actually see him quite a bit before he died. But uh, I do feel like I learned a lot from him and as do my siblings in the same way. But business wise, you know, our motto is Mars has it. And it didn't just apply to the part on the shelf. You, know, you had to be open seven days a week, six nights, 364 days a year. Mm. The only place years for years open on Sundays. You had to have qualified staff on hand to have people to get the right parts in the shortest amount of time. Old car, new car, if we didn't have it, he'd put it in. And the customer was always right, he said, and the idea is to serve people and meet their needs. He took risks when he saw opportunities, investing in machinery for the machine shop and converting a furniture store and a warehouse into a state-of-the-art repair shop. On a personal level, my sister Becky put it best. Dad gave us responsibilities and didn't think we couldn't do it. He never made us girls feel we were less able to do anything just because we were girls. Growing up in a family-owned business made us see how much work and care goes into it. We learned that work is enjoyable and having work is a good thing. Working at the family business as youngsters gave us a sense of meaning and self-esteem. And dad was a dedicated father and husband. No hobbies or group of friends. He just worked the business. He loved and provided for his family in many ways and family came first. I remember the Big E show being held in Atlantic City in the 70s, and our parents got automotive themed bright colored jumpsuits for us all. I think it said Phillips 66 on them. Rented a house, and we all played hooky running around the convention, meeting manufacturer reps that filled our bags with pens and keychains and stickers. 
He wanted us to be with him all the time. And that's a big contrast to today's family unfriendly atmosphere of shows and conventions and events. This is something to consider as employees, let alone successors, are hard to find. I asked my daughter, Jessica, about what she's learned from working with me at the store. And she said she likes the chill home dad better than the highly focused work dad. <laughs> but, uh, she also said that working at the store in the inner city gave her a glimpse into parts of the world that many people can't fathom. I raised my kids in a nice town called New Hope, Pennsylvania, an hour away from the store. The contrast was night and day. It gave her an appreciation for hard work but for also how fortunate she was not to live in a dirty trash filled neighborhood where you have to step over needles strewn about by addicts. Mm. Like a real life episode of Scared Straight, more on that later, but <laughs> there's a lot of talk about youth indoctrination and grooming these days. And I'm grateful for my parents bringing me up in the family business. It was some very good indoctrination and grooming, I should say. Mm. Did, uh, did your dad or anyone else in the family share any stories about the history of the business? Uh, you know, what do you know about the early years of uh, Morris Auto Parts? Well, I'll be honest, uh, not a lot, but uh, I know they sold some uh, buggy parts along with auto parts at the beginning. And, and uh, my uncle Morris actually came home from World War One and I and was ready to make its mark on the world. And my father was only 10 in 1922 when Morris opened up the store. Uh, their father passed away around that time and their mother was busy running the family tobacco store. She couldn't read or write English and only spoke it brokenly. Morris acted like a father to my, to my dad, and his older sister Esther would also look after him as he grew up. Morris also paid for my father to go to college, obviously from the auto parts store. Hmm. And when the stock market crashed, the business was doing so well, my dad dropped out of Temple Law School to work at the store during the Depression era. You always had money in your pocket, he said, working at the store, which most people were not as fortunate during those times to have. My father ultimately got married to his first wife, Ruth, and then went off to serve in World War II in the Navy, along with his new brother-in-laws, Ben and Jay Tipton. He always shot. He always said he shot down a bunch of Japanese planes, but he must have been using a potato cannon because we're fairly sure he worked in the kitchen. So. <laughs> when they came home from the war, everyone wanted to work. Tragically, in the early 50s, over a short period of time, both my dad's brother, Morris, and my dad's wife, Ruth, passed. My father moved back to the Kensington compound and fought a sibling lawsuit over control and ownership of Morris Auto Parts. And after settling and paying them off, he became the sole proprietor of Morris Auto Parts. He met my mother, Mary Ellen, in the late 50s, and they were married and had seven kids over 14 years. I think that was the succession plan. So, <laughs> but this was plenty of motivation for him to drive the auto parts business. He expanded the machine shop, opened up the repair shop over the next two de decades, and bought the surrounding real estate. But his age was catching up with him. He was slowing down, and his kids were growing up but not staying in the business. He supported all of his kids, all their ambitions and activities well, without hesitation. He paid for college for whomever wanted to go, gave us money to help up start up businesses or buy real estate investments. I remember in high school, I spent one summer going to Phillips Academy prep school, taking classes on government and foreign affairs and another summer at Harvard University taking economics, all this time away from the business. When I got accepted in the University of Pennsylvania, there was no hesitation to pay for it but he didn't really believe that a liberal arts undergrad degree was a good value, not even in an Ivy League. He actually offered to give me $40,000 if I didn't go to college and open up a second machine shop while taking some business classes locally. Ultimately, I chose to go to a smaller school with small class sizes that was about 90 minutes away, majoring in finance, and I lived on campus. As I said, he died my junior year in 1988. Hmm. And you took over the business in 1989, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Um, when you took over, uh, you know, third generation of the family to take over the business, uh, you know, what were your priorities? Uh, did you feel like, you know, the business needed to change with the times? Well, my initial priority was to try to bring the family back into the business. Mm. I'm, I'm number five, affectionately known as number five. Mm. And uh, however, my older siblings all went their own ways and they were happy doing what they were doing. One of my younger brothers, Gene, named after my dad, wanted to be in the business. So three years later, he graduated in 92 at LaSalle and came to work full time. And after a few years, my mother cautiously gave us the business and the properties as she knew that for most people, this could be a big burden trying to run and manage it all. And my brother and I worked a few years together, opened a second location outside the city, but he decided he wanted out. We came to an agreement and I became the sole owner of Morris Auto Parts. Business-wise, there were many challenges around that late 80s and 90s time period. 
I had addressed some while still in college. I had been doing the payroll by hand for a couple of years on paper, so I computerized that in my junior year. Senior year, I tackled computerizing the point of sale, purchasing and inventory management with a Triad Series 12 computer. And we had to update the repair shop equipment with computers for writing repair orders and analyzing engine performance. I needed a new accountant. My parents had only really had an account that just did their taxes. I needed monthly financials and had to separate the three segments to see how each was performing. I ultimately settled on a well-known industry accountant, Jack Spector, whose daughter Andrea still does our accounting for us today. I needed somebody that understood our business and had experience to share with us. I quickly found out that the machine shop was losing money and I tried turning it around, but the volume did not sustain the payroll and the various manners I'd hired had too many comebacks. The neighborhood started to decline as well and the quality of help in the area plummeted the quality of the techs at the local shops fell for the same reason. And this is one of the reasons we opened up a store in the suburbs. Plus the volume machine shop work was actually going down with the quality of the cars that were out there. So we closed the machine shop, but continued to take the work in and sublet it to another shop. When I brought my brother Gene out in 1995, we had to split up the businesses. So I kept the auto parts stores and properties while Gene took the repair shop and properties, still leaving me with a balance to pay him off over the next several years. He got married, sold everything, and moved to Florida a year or so later. That same year, I also got married, and we had two kids over the next five years. My, my wife was an attorney, but we both agreed that we wanted her to stay at home. So being a business owner gave us that flexibility to raise the kids while she also did home office work that freed me up to work on the, building the business bigger and more profitable. And the two locations without my brother being at one became too much to handle, so I decided to concentrate on just the Philly store and close down the Ben Salem one. And after closing the machine shop, we remodeled the area and moved our paint and body supplies out of the back of the store, making it mostly a separate PBE jobber. It was a great move and actually we continue to do well with it today. And today we stock Transstar's Nomex paint system, but I'd like to give a shout out to Richard Rivera for being an awesome rep for us. And our priorities were getting quality help, staying up with changing car systems. It was important to me. Everyone received training in parts and paints and we got certified in everything we could, ASE, ICAR, and whatever the manufacturers mm -hmm. and paint companies offered. And another challenge we faced was parts proliferation. Remember that oldie but goodie? We had been buying many lines direct for years and had a lot of old and obsolete inventory in the store, but there were now large WDs serving the market and they helped clean up quite a bit of that and gave us more frequent replenishment. But it was at the expense of profitability or price competitiveness. And, and you, you mentioned your daughter works uh, works in the business. Is she still? Well, she's actually a senior at uh, Pitt. She has worked just like I did you know, in the business at times. During the like, summer breaks and, and stuff summer like that. Summer breaks, whenever I could sneak her down. Yep. Is anyone else in the family still involved? Cousins or anything like that? Or? Um, nobody that's uh, related directly. No. Nope. Okay. Well, you mentioned earlier, um, you talked about Morris Auto Parts being in an urban area. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I looked it up um, on, on a map and, and you know, it's, it's just a bit north of downtown Philadelphia on the mm -hmm. other side of the Delaware River. Um, you know, after 100 years, I'm sure it's, it's obviously become a fixture in the community. Um, I, I'd love to, uh, to learn a little bit more about the location. You know, what's the neighborhood like? Uh, what's your customer demographic like? And, uh, you know, what kind of relationships have has the, the, the business built with uh, the people in the neighborhood? Well, this is going to be a, an answer that you're going to be happy you asked the question and you're going to be like, oh, my God, I'm sorry I asked it. <laughs> but, uh, anybody that's talked to me there over the last couple of years, well, you'll understand why as I get there. Yeah. But the, uh, the neighborhood has changed. It's, it was a hardworking immigrant um, neighborhood with thriving retail corridor. To the it's changed from that to the poorest in the city and maybe in all large U.S. cities. On mm. top of that. The city's allowing open air drug sales and use of over the all over the surrounding area, basically. It's, it's the opioid epidemic ground zero. And it doesn't do it justice, but you can see pictures and video if you if you search Kensington Beach. And you regularly see ad addicts jabbing needles into their arms, legs, necks, doing it to someone else all day long. There's rats, trash, drug dealers, unsanitary conditions exist throughout. And the laws are being selectively enforced in the city. A call to my councilwoman, Maria Quinonez's office, resulted in her being too busy to talk or return any of my calls, and her staff passed the buck telling me to call the mayor. It's his fault. They can't do anything about it. And uh, I recently actually had a talk to the Dr. Oz, who's running for the open Senate seat in Pennsylvania. 
and he has been visiting the area frequently, assessing the situation and resources. He laid out, laid out an interesting plan to me to clean up the area and the situation. I really hope someone does something for this area. It's criminal and inhumane to let people live this way, as well as completely illegal to force the poor residents with young kids of the area to be subjected to this kind of unsafe, unsanitary conditions, let alone the businesses that have to operate there. But Philadelphia has the highest violent rate, violent crime rate of the 10 largest cities in the U.S., as well as the highest poverty rate among those cities. One's chances of becoming a victim of either violent or property crime is one in 25. And sometimes I feel like a real life episode of the Green Arrow, watching the leadership fail this city over and over again. Hmm. And my daughter came up with some funny jingles because of the neighborhood. She's like, she had this one. She said, when you're in the hood and you need some goods, come to Morris Auto Parts. <laughs> we never yes. did use it, but uh, yes. it was funny just to laugh at, at home. I love and, it. Uh, so, right, come on down, right? Get your auto parts right down here where I just described and, and or open up a store here, right? Yep. And uh, all that being said, there are many hardworking people who live and work around us. The vehicle park is older, of course, which is good for business. Yep. And we have a lot of DIY, do-it-yourselfers, shops, fleets, body shops, shade tree mechanics, and industrial customers. The Spanish is spoken by many in the area, but all languages and nationalities come in. We play charades and we play Pictionary to figure out what they need, and they're grateful and come back. I think we have a good relationship with the people in the neighborhood. Our employees all live in and around the store. We've taken on many interns from the local tech schools and in co-op programs and have hired them as employees part-time while they finish school. And I've also sat on many school board advisory boards. And most of the students usually want to be technicians working at a dealer or municipality, but we have kept a few over the years and as well as many stay as customers. We're open seven days and the neighborhood sees that we're there working hard, serving the community. If they need a copy, we make it. They need a fax, we fax it. They need an office supply, we sell them whatever we have in the store. Mm -hmm. And we clean our sidewalks all day long, put out trash cans so the passerbys don't litter. We don't buy anything from the addicts that come in all day long trying to sell something they stole mm -hmm. from another business or neighborhood resident. And listen, when, when the riots and the looting occurred in 2020, which I'm sure you saw, for several days before they sent the National Guard in, into Kensington, we opened and closed every day for praying every night that we didn't get hit. And when the mob came down Kensington Avenue, my employees quickly pulled down the overhead shutters. The mob ripped down some of my neighboring businesses, metal doors and picked them and picked them clean and lit some of them on fire. Mm -hmm. But I don't condone that whatsoever, but we're right. grateful we were spared. Do you think that the fact that Morris Auto Parts was spared during the riots, do you think that had anything to do with just maybe the respect that the people in the neighborhood had for this being a... Uh, a, a business that's been here for a hundred years and a local, you know, a local business, or was it just maybe coincidence, you know, just a lucky, uh, lucky break or. I don't know. Yeah. I, I tend to think a lucky break, but it, it certainly could have been, you know, but when my guy was pulling the uh, doors down and uh, you know, the mob was there, some of the, the forward people in the mob, and he was like fumbling locks around just trying to get it done because he could mm -hmm. see what was coming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the guy said, Oh, don't worry. We're not going to hit your place. So oh. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I think it, it could have been random. It could have been. Yeah. There were so many people out looting. It was, you know, and people from other neighborhoods. So. Yeah. Yeah. True. I, and I think you've kind of touched on this a little bit. I was going to ask you to talk about some of the challenges of, of running a business in an urban area. Um, I, have, I have more. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's hear it. Okay. I mean, some of them <clears> I haven't <throat> already, but uh, you know, quality help in the neighborhood. You know, unfortunately, you know, the allure of big money selling drugs is hard to compete with. You know, I've had people that came off the street that were selling drugs, and then they went back onto the street selling drugs when they left because it was hmm. such good money. Wow. So attracting, attracting quality help that is willing to work in the hood if you're not from there, it's mm -hmm. even harder. So, yeah, theft is an issue. We've had several break-ins, shoplifting, vandalism, uh, internal theft. Uh, you, know, you have the safety of the employees to watch out for in their, in their cars. So you have cameras and you have to be vigilant. And uh, I mean, addicts often cause damage in the form of vandalism or trying to walk away with anything that isn't bolted down. And mm -hmm. Some things that are. Uh, Graffiti is a daily battle. Uh, insurance costs. You imagine what they are with all these risks. Um, you know, we had to go to employees using their own vehicles. Um, a lot of congestion in the city makes it hard to have consistency in making deliveries. Um, health care. It's kind of hard to re really maintain a health care plan because so many people just don't want to have health care. You know, they're either getting it through some relative or they just don't want to have to do the co-pays. 
So hmm. they're they're taking their own risks. But uh, customer repeat business is a challenge. You know, if people don't have to come down into the city or particularly my part of the city, you know, I'm sure they stop in somewhere else. And uh, so the things that they know they could find anywhere else, you know, they'll, they'll just get there. But I'm sure if you lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, even probably over every year, just for the city's leadership failure to, to enforce these laws. But mm -hmm. uh, facility conditions, I mean, I, I need to update them, you know, the exterior, the, the interior. But it, it seems like a waste until they solve this problem with the attics that until they're taken off the street. So. Mm -hmm. We're going to switch yeah. gears just a little bit here uh, and talk about uh, POJA. Um, when you were featuring Counterman back in 2006, the article mentioned the Poja Warehouse. And the uh, Counterman article explained that this is a group of independent wholesale and retail distributors in New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, formed in response to the growing competition from larger chain operations and from the notion that manufacturers were taking the independent wholesale distributor business for granted. So, And I also took a look at the Poja website, and, and we actually met uh, earlier this year. Uh, I know there's there's quite a story behind this. Take us through what is Poja and uh, how did you how did you get involved? Sure, sure. Listen, uh, you know the full story is on our website, as you said, and uh, you know, but I'll, I'll give you the short version, and that's hey, margins were compressing, and we needed to find a way to combat it. You know, in the fall of 1996, a, a local longtime WD rep named George Taylor, who had opened up a store of his own with three of his sons, one night corralled a bunch of the top local jobbers he knew for dinner. He said, there was a lot of lamenting going on at that meeting as I took notes mm -hmm. and we began to meet regularly every month with a lot of communications in between meetings and admittedly a lot of complaining. <laughs> at, at one of the early meetings, one of the members and actually a subsequent editorial contributor to Counterman Magazine named Mike Demers mm -hmm. jokingly said, we were the PO jobbers of America or POJA for short. <laughs> and hey, we kept the name and we ran with it. It resonated and, uh, and it still does. So I, I distinctly remember one early attendee, Frank Bruno, that stopped attending for quite a while, but came back later remarking how much the group had changed from initially being a gripe session. He then told us his mantra by quoting Eleanor Roosevelt, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And boy, did we start lighting some candles. We used our combined volume as clout to negotiate marketing funds, free goods, changeover deals, all that had been going to the WDs we were buying from or to the two steppers in our market. There was and is a lot of a talent in and experience in POJA. Some were great in marketing, some were great in inventory management, some in technology, some in finding new lines in every aspect of the business. And here is my, I'd like to thank the Academy list of shout outs <laughs> to the many men and women of POJA who shared their knowledge of both their successes and failures and expended their energies on this group that ultimately led to the 12 years later opening of POJA Warehouse, a co-op WD owned by and for the jobbers. And in no particular order, and I hope I haven't missed too many, Mike Demers, Bob Wazilowski, Bob McLaughlin and his son, Glenn, Elliot Brown, Ben and Barry Yellowitz, Ed Gallagher and his son, Tom Gallagher, Bob Furry and his daughter, Debbie and son-in-law, GP, Al and Linda Ricky, Ed Schroeder, Gil Cheeseman, Dallas Peterson, Steve Millivoy, Joe Gentilly, Mark Christopher, John Keslaw, Frank Bruno, Jerry Syrak and his son, Wayne Paré, Carl Byer, Clive Trehorn, Andy Salnick, Bill Rice, Don Smith, Michelle Degler, and of course, George Taylor. Without each other, most would agree, we would not have gotten to where we are today. How has POJA helped Morris Auto Parts and other independent jobbers compete with the two-step parts distributors? Well, you know, listen, it, it gave us independence from other WDs. I mean, that meant we made the rules. That, that benefited the jobber, not the WD. So POJA makes low margins and it bleeds more the, the margins to the jobber to keep them competitive. Marketing funds that were kept by the WDs are now ours again. You know, to use for our own programs that work for our local markets, uh, stock adjustments, returns, hours of operations, and more, all geared towards the jobber needs. So if a two-stepper, in other instances, if a two-stepper was in several of our markets, they knew a member wasn't like a stray calf to be targeted. You know, we could and would and did retaliate in other markets where we had member stores. So, you know, the previous trade-off that I, I mentioned earlier of clean inventory and regular replenishment versus being competitive, was solved by having our own co-op WD, Poja Warehouse. Mm -hmm. And if I'm understood correctly, you're in the uh, Poja Warehouse today? I am sitting in the uh, office upstairs right now. Very cool, very cool. Um, I know technology has been a big focus for Poja to uh, kind of help level the playing field for independent uh, jobbers. Could you talk about some of these initiatives like uh, ePART? 
Um, sure. I think uh, you know we did a lot of technology uh, initiatives, and you know before actually Poja had a building, there was UJA, which is United Jobber Alliance. It was ten independent stores sharing a single triad activant computer system. Big shout out to Justin Kubnick, our consultant, for helping us herd all these cats onto a single shared system. And the incremental cost of adding locations was minimal, so we all saved a lot of money. And uh, we, but we reinvested that savings to hire a longtime IT professional from Triad called Lowell Leisinger. And he helped manage files, keep networks operating, fix hardware issues, taking many of the hats off of the independent jobbers' heads and freed that time up to do things to grow their business. Centralization started becoming a real thing for us. And besides that, Lowell implemented an inventory balancing program across all these stores that in less than two years shifted over $600,000 of overstock, slow and dead inventory from locations that didn't need it to locations that were about to order it. That was a lot of cash flow that the jobbers were able to redeploy, adding new lines and our new numbers, making us stronger. And being on the same system, sharing data allowed us for to easily check across multiple locations if numbers were moving and worth putting into stock, ensuring you know, we spent our money wisely. And we also used savings to buy barcode readers, to pick and receive and do point of sale entry. That increased our accuracy and productivity even more, generating better profits and better customer satisfaction. Electronic delivery tracking and dispatching systems were deployed at most stores. And as a result, everyone's business became more productive and more profitable at a mere fraction of the cost than if they had done everything on their own. And you mentioned ePart. You know, at Morris Auto Parts, I adopted that concept early with the telepart terminals that Triad laid out for the Series 12. Next part and ePart eventually came along, and that was great you know, for people to find out if something was available and order it. And with experienced counter staff being harder to find and keep, these portals allowed for more business to flow in without hiring more people. And in the same vein, many years ago, when we were struggling to get drivers, I implemented an online and pickup at the store or POJA that backed out the cost of delivery and some of the counter expense to give them, our customers, a great price and an incentive for them to send a runner to go get the parts. That program grew very nicely. And as customers liked the convenience of the 24 hour access to availability and pictures, they loved the great pricing. And we we're actually ahead of the, the curve on that offering and really are still ahead because it's the retailers and wholesalers that do offer, offer the buy online and pick up, but they're still charging the full price as though they were delivered. Mm -hmm. And with Mars, when the customer does the work, they save the money. So sharing a computer system also allowed for another centralized savings. We were able to afford a well-known local buyer, Tom Spanfelder, who could not who could not only buy for Poja, but also had access to member stores data and files and could do their ordering, add new numbers, do stock adjustments at a mere fraction of the cost of employing someone like him at every location separately. And several members had or have had eBay and Amazon stores, including myself, but post the Poja inventory along with theirs for sale. And I personally moved away from that as I didn't see helping Amazon was in my long term best interest. Mm. Just me. Yeah. Other members are still <laughs> generating volume there and hope profits too. So um, social media is another avenue that we use in marketing and gener to generate repeat and new business. But while it can definitely generate business, I decided that me personally and Morris Auto Parts would not support most of these platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as their policies of censorship are, are basically ideologically opposed to my values of free speech in America. Good so I deleted all of them. And I wanted to make money, but not at the cost of my conscience and the soul or the future of America. Mm -hmm. And there are other new platforms out there and they'll be exploring those that, that don't cross that line. Mm. And uh, one other initiative, was sharing a phone system across multiple locations. And this use of VoIP phones also allowed me to employ a longtime valuable employee who became disabled by allowing him to work from home, doing invoicing, answering calls, and even dispatching. And it has to be close to 15 years since we've been doing that, you know, long before this whole COVID work at home thing happened. That is so cool. Um, all great examples of, of you know, using technology to kind of level the playing field for the, uh, the small sure. independent uh, Distributors, jobbers, that's uh, that's really cool. Um, how many members does POJA have today? Uh, actively, you know, I counted running, active running member stores, we're at 11. Uh, okay. there are, I think we started out with almost 30 and uh, there are a dozen or more OWA, we call them outside warehouse accounts. They're, store, they're buying various amounts from us as well. Uh, there's several key employees own shares as well. So they're vested in the success of POJA and uh, any members have sold uh, retired, uh, and sadly, some have passed away. 
but uh, we do welcome new members and OWA, of course. Are you still having the monthly meetings? That's a good question. You know, obviously with COVID, they had to stop. Um, restaurants weren't open places we couldn't meet at. Uh, in addition to COVID, we all got very busy. I mean, due to the free money that the government handed out and the, and the shortage of workers applying for jobs, it's exacerbated that shorthandedness. Yeah. And uh, the great resignation, it's really hard to find even the people that you know that are qualified. So uh, we had some Zoom meetings, but uh, they just weren't the same. And uh, we, need, we need to get back to them, having them personally uh, every month. And I think once the summer busy season's over, we'll, we'll resume. <clears throat> um, I got to meet you back in March at the Automotive Parts Associates annual shareholder conference in Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. As President Apoja, you're a board member for APA. Um, tell me about the relationship between Poja and APA. How did that come about? Well, you know, before the building, uh, several of us were buying three to six lines direct each. And we started looking at buying groups to get better discounts and rebates. Uh, ben Yellowitz of Crest joined the APA himself and some others joined AMC and B. A APA was a much stronger group and we gravitated towards them. But as we tried to get other APA approved lines, we were shot down because we did not actually have a physical building. So we spoke to Dan Freeman, the current president of APA at that time, who said we cannot go, he couldn't go to bed for us without having a building. But he said, if you build it, they will come. Mm. And so we started our search for real estate in the 2006-2007 timeframe, and settlement occurred in January 2008. Um, how has uh, APA supported POJA's mission and helped POJA's members stay competitive? Well, that's a little bit of a longer story, um, <laughs> as I think most of my stories are. Yeah, yeah that's okay. But, uh, once we had our building, uh, APA went to bat for us and manufacturers came to hear our story and we slowly added lines into the warehouse, having to prove ourselves capable of running a WD as a merry band of jobber pirates, really. And uh, members were able to get lines for a lot less from other WDs and had access less than from other WDs and had mm. access to new and different lines as well as giving them more profits in both cases. To say APA is just a buying group though is a major understatement. It has been a lot more than just a source for rebates. It has been a true brotherhood and sisterhood of distributors of all sizes, one for all and all for one, very in line with POGES values. And there are huge members like Best Buy in Canada and Factory Motor Parts headquartered in Minnesota, as well as some very small import parts specialists. And we continued to, we continued to network our butts off with all the APA members. And we knew it was smarter to learn from other people's mistakes than from our own. They invite us into their businesses for tours and discussions about best practices, I rarely took a vacation or trip that I didn't plan to stop at a member's location that was on the way or in the area to pick up a good idea or two to make Morris, Poja, or its members and APA the best they can be. If we couldn't get a line direct, another APA member would sell us that line at a minimal markup. Shout out to Rob Jacobs, especially, who really spent a lot of time helping us to get Poja running most efficiently. When my son Jacob recently moved to Palmdale, California, Jim Holquist of H&H &H found him a great independent repair shop to fix his car and save him thousands over the cost of the dealer who was gonna charge him. The atmosphere and culture has always been one of family. Yep. Even at the annual conferences, the member spouses, as well as the manufacturer rep spouses are all welcome and encouraged to attend. You can't put a price on that kind of fellowship. It's invaluable. Mm -hmm. Now with Steve Tucker at the helm and many new faces, at the office with great expertise, backgrounds, and talent, there's a renewed energy in the group. The reps all felt it at our annual meeting this past March where you were. They're on the move was a common sentiment expressed by the reps. Of mm. course, the acquisition of the True Star Group is one of the factors that added to the excitement. And uh, so now that Poge is well-established, we're able to give back and help other members in need of getting access to certain brands at minimal markup for us pushing paperwork until they can buy the line direct on their own or we can share our best practices that we've learned over the last 26 years. To sum it up, APA provides POJA and its members additional exposure to suppliers and programs we might not easily access otherwise. And POJA gets a little more credence with suppliers than we might get on our own. Conversely, POJA provides APA members a way to access lines via dropship at a very reasonable cost. So it really is a symbiotic relationship in many ways. Well said. If somebody wanted to join POJA, how would they go about doing that? 
Well, I would say that if your business is in the New Jersey, Eastern-ish PA or Delaware area, I would say to contact me directly yeah. and uh, we can discuss the cost and benefits of being a member versus uh, an OWA. Mm -hmm. If your business is further away or simply you just want to do drop shipments for manufacturers, I would recommend that you look at joining APA as a member by either contacting me or illustrious and sometimes handsome President Steve Tucker. <laughs> and, and I'm curious, how, how far is the Poja Warehouse from Morris Auto Parts? Uh, I like to tell customers eight to ten minutes. It's really okay. right in our market. Okay. Uh, we're going to shift the conversation back to where it all started, and that's the 100th anniversary of Morris Auto Parts. Uh, looking back at the rich history of the business, why do you think Morris Auto Parts has been able to stand the test of time while other independents in this injury, industry have not been so fortunate? Well, I'm sure there's a lot of luck involved, and uh, I certainly can't say as to why anybody else hasn't made it. I, and I've seen a lot of places liquidate and close down. And you know, we bought a lot of stuff from places that had the... the went out of business, mm -hmm. um, particularly during the 2008 recession, was it called? Um, yeah. you know, I can tell you what we did do to stay relevant and in the game, most of which I've told you a lot already, but I think this article I once read about having a, a sentimental attachment to an uneconomic asset, it really hit home. Uh, I'm very sentimental, you know, but you can't go down with the ship. You can't let the ship go down. You know, my family was always reinvesting in the business and in the real estate. We also tried new segments to diversify and differentiate ourselves, working smarter, not just harder. They lived frugally. You know, the millionaire next door, we kept cars for 20 years and drove them around, saved money for rainy days rather than putting it in a lifestyle. We've invested in our kids' educations, but also had us work at the store for real world experience and appreciation for what it takes to earn money from the very young ages. And although I'm pretty sure there was some kind of barter program in those early years for me, my daughter said she agrees. She pretty much remembers doing the same thing. So, mm -hmm. but a strong work ethic was instilled and a sense of confidence was gained. And carrying, of course, listen, carrying large inventories, being open seven days, 364, 364 days a year has helped keep their customers coming. You know, that's, that's the basics. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, uh, a pretty strong foundation for success uh, right there. Um, as you look ahead to the next 100 years, uh, what do you see as the biggest threats for Morris Auto Parts and other independents out there in the uh, aftermarket? Good question. You know, there's been threats coming at us all, all years long. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the future, um, I only see things as opportunities, really. Make lemonade out of lemons, right? And, uh, but vying for qualified help while making the margins to pay for them will continue to be an issue. Uh, affording the people and the tech to sell online and for, for them to either deliver or pick up at the store or warehouse. Um, I see continued consolidation, you know, closing certain distribution channels to independent stores. Uh, this also means losing partners and their volume in our POJA and APA groups. So, you know, this really makes succession planning paramount, you know, to yeah. keeping that critical mass, let alone growing. And uh, in Morris Auto Parts, succession has been rocky at best. You know, my dad had to buy out his three other siblings. I had to pay off my brother. Then I went through an 11-year divorce. I had to pay out even more. Uh, any of these scenarios could have been the end of the story. And somehow we made it 100 years. But as far as the next generation to run Morris, once I run out of steam, and, and first I'd like to say that I have a lot of energy and, uh, and I have a lot of unfinished initiatives that I'd like to see get carried through by myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, But that being said, my son is an engineer for Lockheed in California. who once told me when I asked him about doing what I do, he replied, that I was on the phone too much day and night, and he just wanted to work his nine to three and go home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, as I said, is a rising senior at Pitt, majoring in bioengineering with a promised career ahead of her in that field of her choice. So perhaps a grandchild one day or a niece or a nephew might take interest, or maybe I should have had more kids like my dad. <laughs> but, uh, it, is what, it is what it is, but uh, honestly, I think succession uh, planning is, is huge to, for the longevity. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Well, there is, Josh. You, uh, you frame this as a classic story of the American dream, and uh, I wholeheartedly agree. The story takes place in America where there are freedoms that create opportunities that attracted my grandparents and allowed my family to live this dream. I think as a country, we need to reflect and take the recent supply chain issues as a wake-up call, and we should be looking at where we source our parts from and where they're manufactured. Through globalization, 
we've gotten ourselves into bed with countries that don't have constitutions protecting individual freedoms and liberty. Mm -hmm. And frankly, these countries couldn't care less if our kids or grandkids have freedoms, let alone achieve the American dream. We have made that bed we are now lying in to buy cheap goods, and it's getting very uncomfortable. And it's time to pick up our pillows and blankets and change our mattress to one where our freedoms, livelihoods, and our way of life is protected. It starts at home and it applies to business as well. I know I will do my part. <laughs> yeah, let's bring, man bring manufacturing back to America. Th thank you again for this opportunity to tell my family story. You know, we oh. hope your listeners and watchers found it worthy of their time. We sure do appreciate it. Um, taking the time out of your busy schedule, um, you know, running a running a business, a very a busy uh, uh, art store and, and uh, warehouse operation. So we're, we're really grateful. And uh, uh, I think I think you were the perfect guest to uh, kind of launch this uh, this podcast. Uh, thanks again. Congratulations on 100 years. And we wish you uh, nothing but the best going forward. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Behind the Counter podcast. To stay up to date on the latest news and trends, as well as the latest podcast episodes, be sure to subscribe to the Counterman newsletter at counterman.com.